Hello, thanks for tuning in. And today we're going to sing um, songs about conquering in the Lord and our God is for us and who can be against us if our God is for us. So let's lift our voice and sing as we worship him.
eyes of God look upon me my side as I wait heart of God satisfy and sustain as I hear voice of
see grace as you see I'm standing here in the sanctuary and I was truly hoping that we would be gathered here together today but we have experienced a few wrinkles and we're not here together I'm sure you've seen the video that we posted uh, on Friday be praying for these uh, things be praying for the church be praying for church leadership during these times and be praying for one another. Be praying for our government leaders and those who've been, uh, who've been uh, placed in authority, that they will have discernment and wisdom as we continue to deal with COVID-19. I look forward to seeing you this Wednesday night right here in prayer. We have the church set up where we uh, will be able to follow the recommendations for social distancing and good hygiene practices. But we, we will be able to come together in prayer and devotion and go to our Lord together, assemble here together. We will have uh, the ability to uh, have people within the church building and we will be able to have groups no larger than 25. So I'm encouraged about that. Thank you for yesterday for uh, Spring Clean, and thank you for all of your prayers and participations we've had in ministry. We're going to continue to those of you who are staying at home due to underlying conditions and continuing to quarantine. We will be ministering to you on an ongoing basis uh, until we all can assemble together here once again in the church together fellowshipping, worshiping, and praising the Lord. I am so grateful for Kayla and the melody she brought us this morning, the words and lyrics that were so uh, relevant to the day we live in. So thank you, Kayla, for that uh, time of worship and praise. We are coming to the very end today of the Blessed Life series. I've been so excited and uh, renewed by this series and how the Lord would like uh, and desire and command uh, true kingdom citizens to live for his glory and his purpose. And today we're going to close in that series. Next week as we come together, we're going to start a new series that I'm very excited about. And we're going to name that Moses and the plan of God. We're going to look at Moses' life and, and uh, circumstances within his life. Uh, as we go to Exodus, and we're going to bounce from there and back to, uh, to the New Testament. And we're going to look at Moses and God's plan, and we're going to see how that relates to us today. Last week, we saw that we must pray to our Father in heaven and ask him for his strength to live the radically different life he's called us to and the humanly impossible life he's called us to that Jesus wants us to be as his true kingdom citizens. We saw that that comes through the power and strength of the Lord as we ask him to let us be the people who demonstrate those qualities and character traits not only in our heart, but as we outwardly live towards others. And I challenged you last week to pray the Sermon on the Mount to open your Bible, write down areas in the Sermon on the Mount that you see the Holy Spirit convicting you in, that you want to see changes in your life, and ask your Heavenly Father for them. 
Those are definitely prayers that fall within his perfect will for you. And I pray and trust you did just that. You will soon see that when you pray as you should, you will begin to live as you should. How we pray allows the Holy Spirit to change and transform our, our lives in position to where God would have us be. I hope that this last week you took that to heart. This morning we are going to conclude our study in the Sermon on the Mount. I pray it's been a blessing for you. I'm very thankful for technology because all of those messages are on our website and you can always go back and listen and or refer to them. As you may recall, we finished with nine messages on the Beatitudes. And before we went to the very heart of the Sermon on the Mount, the rest of it, we looked at the passage we're going to be in today, except for verse 12. And we saw that in the message, look at your here do. We saw that what you hear and what you do is important. We did this to ask, to ask ourselves as we went through chapter 5 through 7, whether we heard the words of Jesus and did or did not do what he said. D that we either do it or we do not. What do you hear and what do you do? Everyone should know what their hairdo looks like as they see in the mirror. We should also know what our hairdo looks like and not deceive ourselves. So today we will not go over that part of this passage. Today, as we leave our study of the Sermon on the Mount, I want to appeal to all of us to respond properly and positively to what I see are some key points that Jesus leaves with us. First, we're going to look at today, Jesus leaves us with a rule to live by in Matthew 7, 12. He says, in everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. Well, this, of course, is widely known as what? It's known as the golden rule. It's the golden rule. The commentator William Barclay says, With this commandment, the Sermon on the Mount reaches its summit and its peak. With this commandment, we're at the summit, we're at the peak of it. This saying that Jesus has uh, been called the capstone of the whole discourse of the Sermon on the Mount. Here is the capstone. And I would agree with that. But I would say that it is even more than that. I believe this rule epitomizes all the scriptures in a nutshell when it comes to how Jesus wants us to treat people. How Jesus wants us to treat others. Jesus said this golden rule is the law and the prophets in tw uh, verse 12. Jesus said on another occasion that something else fulfilled the law and the prophets, and that's namely love. He said in Matthew 22, 36 through 40, let's see that. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Here's a question posed to him. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Therefore, we are to love God with all our hearts and we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. On these two commandments, which is the vertical and the horizontal, how we love God, how we love people, depend the whole law and the prophets. James 2 calls this loving our neighbors as ourselves, calls it the royal law. So here we have the golden rule and we have the royal law. So we have the golden rule, which does not mention at any time the word love, and the royal rule of love and both equal the same thing. Wait a minute. Hmm. Well, let's look at it just a little bit. The law and the prophets is what they equal. Do you see here the wonderful thing Jesus has done for us? 
How do I love my neighbor as myself? How do I put that royal law into practice? Apply the golden rule is basically it. To simplify it, it's like this. The royal law, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. The golden rule is treat your neighbor the way you want to be treated. So the golden rule of life is simply the practical implementation of the royal rule of love. So how do I accomplish this royal rule? I do it practically in the golden rule. How do I want to be treated? Treat others the same way. How do I love my neighbor as myself? Put yourself in their place and ask yourself, how would I want to be treated? And then treat them in that same way. Would you want to be lied to or told the truth? Would you want to be gossiped about or would you rather have that person come to you and ask you the validity of what they've heard? Would you like to be judged without a hearing? Would you like to be intimidated or threatened or beaten? Or would you rather be appreciated, valued, and loved? Would you rather people treat you with kindness or with cruelty? Would you rather they show you mercy when you sin, show you grace and mercy when you fall? Or would you rather them just dump you and leave you and say, I want nothing to do with you? If you were stranded on the highway, would you want somebody to stop and help you? Would you want somebody to be the good Samaritan to you? So this is not rocket science, is it? But it is a life transforming practice when put into practice. When we live this way, it transforms our very lives and ministers to others. You know, there is the deep, deep desire in every person to be loved, appreciated, and valued. But when you are self-centered, you will not do that. When you are self-centered, you will not love as you should. You will not treat people as you want to be treated. You will often break the golden rule. Jesus did not say ever, nor does it ever say in the Bible, it's never commanded to you to love yourself. You will not find that one time in the Bible. Nor did Jesus say here, you must learn to love yourself first before you can love someone else. That modern day psychobabble is exactly what it is, a psychobabble. And it's nowhere found in the word of God. Jesus and the Bible automatically assume the fact that everyone already loves themselves. That's the problem with sin. It's uh, satisfying the desires of our flesh. What we want, when we put ourselves first, we automatically, in our sin natures, love ourselves. This, the, this is, uh, we can see an example uh, as the assumption in the marriage relationship. We see that in Ephesians 5, 28 through 29, where we're told, so husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. So how should I treat this person and show them love? We must step into their place and ask, how would you like to be treated in that situation? and treat them the same way? How would you like to be treated in the situation they're going through? But for us as Christians, there's another level to this than just that. Don't just step into their shoes, but also step up to the cross. Step up to Calvary and look how God has treated you and ask God to help you treat people with the same love, the same compassion, the same grace, the same mercy, the same tenderness. Notice something here of the scope of the rule to live by. Is this limited or unlimited in scope? It is to be exercised, we're told, in everything, which is first in the sentence for emphasis here. In everything towards people. The Greek word is simply others. 
in everything towards all mankind, towards all humanity. This means that in every circumstance and in every situation, this is how you are to treat people. There are no exceptions here. There are no excuses accepted. There are no situation where this is not the rule to live by. This is the expectation and command of our Lord. Even when other people break this rule towards you, when you are hurt, when you're offended or betrayed, when you are happy or when you are sad, when you are busy, when you're in that traffic jam or you're in that accident, when you are faced with a rude fan at a ball game, whatever the situation may be, in every conversation you may have, even in a conversation where you disagree, you're to treat them with compassion and kindness the way you want to be treated. This is the rule to live by. Imagine when we live this way, how in treating other people, people will see Jesus Christ in us. They will see Jesus Christ and say, I want to have what they have. So this is how we're to treat people. Just people? No, all people, all others, whom we know are what? This is what we must never forget is that people are created in the image of God. People for whom Christ died, whether you know it or not, this is what we're doing when we treat people the way we want to be treated. This means your friends and your enemies, people you love and like, and those people you do not your co-workers, your co-students, your spouse, your relatives, the staff at the hospital, the clerk in the store, your neighbor who is whether he's a jerk or not, whether he's kind or not, your child and everyone else's child, your sister, your brother, your parents, your mother-in-law, Democrat, Republican, Trump, or Pelosi. <laughs> that will cause you to be stretched indeed. Red, yellow, black, or white. What's the Bible say? They're all precious in his sight, which is all of humanity, which is all people, rich or poor, and, in ev and everyone in between. All people. All people. Think of how this rule of love could ref revolutionize a life. How it could revolutionize a relationship, a marriage, a home, a neighborhood, a city. A world. Imagine that. So we see that Jesus leaves us with a rule to live by in verse 12. Now he, Jesus leaves us with a choice to make in verses 13 through 14. Let's look at what he says. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Matthew says that when Jesus finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching in verse 28. But Jesus did not teach to amaze. He did not teach to impress people. He teached to save and change people. That's why he came. You know, there are multitudes that admire the teachings of Jesus, but their lives still remain unchanged. Lives are saved and changed only when a choice is made to hear and respond to him. Here in verses 13 through 14, Jesus is saying, in effect, you have heard my teaching. Now you have a choice to make. You've heard what I've had to say. Now choose what you will do. You can follow me and take the narrow gate to life and walk the narrow path of being my disciple or not. Choose. This is not new in God's word. This is the pattern we see throughout the entire Bible. Remember Moses, after giving to the people all God's commandments and instructions, said this in Deuteronomy 30, 19. He said, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today 
that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose. Joshua, he stood before the people and laid before them God's call to love and serve the Lord your God or the gods of their fathers. And he said this, choose for yourself today whom you will serve. Joshua 24, 15, which falls right in line with what Jesus said here in this Sermon on the Mount and back in chapter 6, 24, when he said, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Do you remember? Elijah called on the people to choose. He said, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. 1 Kings 18, 21. What have we been doing? We have spent 28 messages over six months looking at what Jesus has taught. And we could have spent much more time in this message. But where there is no choice made to respond and act on what one has heard, to that person, it is all wasted and useless information. For example, take the golden rule to live by. You have to make a choice. You can say, Lord, I'm going to start living my life by this rule today or not. I choose not to. Will this be hard and seemingly impo an impossible rule to live by? Especially when it comes to some people? <laughs> Obviously, yes. That is when you, as we saw last week, ask God for his provision, for his power, for his strength, and he will give it to you. You see, the teachings of Jesus and the entire Bible are not just about information but transformation in your life. The Bible's not just a book filled with information for you to tuck away in your mind. It's filled with information for you to know and grow in the knowledge of the Lord to transform your life and how you live. From death to life is the transformation. From life to the abundant and blessed life is the goal and transformation. But you know, Nothing changes until you make a choice to respond to the words of Jesus, until you make a choice to take the whole Sermon on the Mount and respond to what he has said, to the word of God wherever it speaks. What, what do we know? We know that life is precious. We know that time is short and of the essence how sad to waste both in living by our rules instead of living a life by the Lord's. Let's have the heart attitude of the psalmist when he said, I have chosen the way of uh, faithfulness. I've set my heart on your laws. I run, notice the word, I run, not live in apathy or complacency, but I run in the path of your commands, for you have broadened my understanding. Psalm 119, 30 and verse 32. So I plead with you today, you have a choice to make. Choose to hear the Lord and put his words into practice. So make that choice today. Make the choice to live the way God would have you live, to live in a way that would be pleasing to him, especially in how you treat other people. Do not halt. Do not hesitate. Do not wait. Do not say maybe tomorrow. Do it now in your heart. Make a commitment in your heart to say, I will do what you tell me to. Do not waste another minute when the blessed life awaits you. Make that decision in your heart. So we have seen Jesus leaves us with a rule to live by. He leaves us with a choice to make. As we close out this series today, Jesus leaves us with a foundation to build on. He says in verse 24, 
Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock, on the rock. Now, as I've already said earlier, we looked at this passage in detail in the message, look at your hearedo. And we saw that in speaking, in that, that this was speaking of building our house on the rock. Both builders in our Lord's parable here hear the words of Jesus, but only one listens to him and obeys him. Jesus is speaking of the wisdom in building our lives on a foundation of rock as opposed to foolishly building our lives on sand. That rock, that solid foundation upon which we can build our lives and the rest of our hopes for all eternity is knowing and obeying Jesus Christ. Jesus tells us in Matthew 7, 24, everyone who hears these words of mine acts on them. This is his expectation, that if you hear his words, you act on them as his kingdom citizens, as his children. Everyone who acts on them is compared to the wise man whose house, whose life has a foundation upon the rock that will stand the test of time, that will stand the test of eternity. So today, as we close our study of the Sermon on the Mount, let's not overlook or take for granted the wonderful blessings here. We can praise God Almighty. Jesus has left us with a foundation to build on. There's an old gospel song I know you're all familiar with it, the solid rock that says, On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Every hope man has outside of Jesus is nothing but sinking sand. It's nothing but futile in a world that is passing away in a world that is passing away and all that is in the world is passing away, 1 John 2, 17. But in Jesus Christ, in the very Son of God, we have a foundation of solid rock. In 1 Corinthians 10, 4, Paul revealed to the Jews that in their exodus and through the wilderness that Christ, the pre-existing Messiah, was their rock. Though they drank from a material rock for sure, the source was a supernatural spiritual rock that protected them and sustained them. That rock was Christ, the pre-existent Messiah, the pre-incarnate Christ. As he was a rock to Israel in the Old Testament, he is a rock to us today. What do we know of him? He is the rock of our salvation. Psalm 95, 1 says, Oh, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. He is the very rock of our strength. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me quickly. Be to me a rock of strength, a stronghold to save me. Psalm 31, 2. He is the rock of our safety. But the Lord has been my stronghold and my God, the rock of my refuge. Psalm 94, 22. He is the rock of supply and the rock of our satisfaction. But I would feed you with the finest of wheat and with honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. Psalm 81, 16. And he is the rock of of our security. Trust in the Lord forever, for in God the Lord we have an everlasting rock, Isaiah 26, 4. Literally, that says we have the rock of ages, the rock of ages. He is our eternal rock. What can we say? What a foundation to build our lives upon. A pure, true, firm, real salvation it, uh, foundation. And it is the only foundation mankind needs in Jesus, our rock. In him, 
we have salvation, strength, safety, supply, satisfaction, and security for all eternity. All we can do is say, praise the Lord, praise Almighty God. We humbly fall down and bow and worship you. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us. You are our rock and we will build on you. We will not only hear what you say, we will do what you say. We will act on it. We will do what you command us to do. And we will treat people as you, as we would want to be treated because we love God and love people. So Jesus leaves us with a rule to live by, a choice to make, and a foundation to build on. I pray that we live by that rule, that we make the right choices, and we build on that foundation all the days of our life until God calls us home. Acts 3.26 says, God raised up his servant, which is Jesus, and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. God raised up his servant, Jesus, to bless you. When we, by God's strength, my friends, and by God's grace, Seek prayerfully to live by his standards. Seek prayerfully to live by the qualities and characteristics he describes in the Sermon on the Mount as his kingdom citizens outlined right here for us. We will experience genuine blessedness, genuine happiness. We will experience the blessed life. I trust and pray that you will obey the Lord that you will allow him to rule and reign in your life. Go back in time and look at the Blessed Life series from time to time and allow God to continue to minister to you. I love you, EC Grace. I look forward to seeing you in this upcoming week. And as we finish this series, I do pray for you that God ushers in the blessed life that he's called you to live in. May you find real happiness in the Lord as you submit to him, follow him, hear him, fellowship with him, and do what he says. You will be the light in the world, salt on the earth. You will be the city on a hill that God intends us to be. God bless you. Live this blessed life. Go after it with everything and make the right choice. Thank you very much. We'll see you soon.